Hi, I'm John Schwant, Professor of Classical Languages at New St. Andrews College and Director of BiblicalGreek.org. You can follow me on Facebook.com slash IBG page or on YouTube. I hope this video on enclitics pushes your understanding of Greek one step further. I will begin this video with a definition of enclitics. First, I will deal with one-syllable enclitics and give you a list and show you how they're used with other words, and then I'll move on to two-syllable enclitics and do the same for them. Then I will summarize all the material and show you how you just have to remember two things when enclitics follow normal words. Then I will get into a little more difficult situations and give you a general rule as well as the exceptions for when enclitics follow proclitics or other enclitics. And then I'll back up and give you the big picture and remind you that typically there are just three things that you need to remember when you run across or you try to use an enclitic. If you haven't seen my other videos on accenting, please watch those first before watching this one. I have some interesting ways of representing syllables and accents. Here I have the last three syllables of a word represented by islands. And then, since enclitics are words that depend on the preceding word for their accent, I will represent the syllables of enclitics with a boat. There are just two kinds of enclitics, those with one syllable and those with two syllables. Now, by adding these additional syllables to a word, it may affect the accenting of the previous word with the following constraint. An enclitic will never cause the accenting of a previous word to move or change. The only possible modifications are the addition of a secondary accent or the placement of an accent on the enclitic. First, let's take a closer look at one-syllable enclitics. There aren't many words that are really one-syllable enclitics, but they have a number of forms. The first one we'll look at are oblique forms of some singular personal pronouns, namely the first and second personal pronouns. Oblique simply means not nominative, so ego is not an enclitic. The accusative me, the genitive mu, and the dative mu are all enclitic. The same goes for the second person. The nominative su is not enclitic, it's orthotone. But the oblique cases, the accusative se, the genitive su, and the dative su are all enclitic. There are normal non-enclitic forms of these words, and most grammars say that these forms are the emphatic forms and the enclitic forms are unemphatic. But on this point, I have to side with A.T. Robertson on page 681.b4, and also Smythe in his second minor note under point 187, where they indicate that the non-enclitic forms of these words are simply the forms used after prepositions. Doing some searches through the New Testament, I can hardly find any times where they're not used after prepositions. So I think Robertson is right when he says emphasis with these words is merely a matter of context. The enclitic forms of these words may be just as emphatic as the non-enclitic forms. Their presence or absence will mainly be governed by the presence or absence of prepositions before them. Another very common enclitic is the nominative singular forms for the indefinite pronoun, tis, anyone, and then the rest of the forms are two-syllable, and we'll get into those later in the video. And then T, something, anything, and the neuter, nominative, and accusative. Uh, and the plurals are two-syllable. We'll get to those later. The Greek interrogative version of this word asks the question who or what, and it always has an acute accent. Likewise, there are indefinite adverb versions of other Greek interrogatives. You might know pu with a circumflex as where. But as an enclitic, it means somewhere. These are not as common as the others, but I thought I would mention them just so my list of one-syllable enclitics would be fairly exhaustive. Pew with an accent would be to where are you going, but without an accent, it means to somewhere. You have seen po as parts of words like upo, meaning not yet, so po is up to this time or yet. And then a very common interrogative post with a circumflex, how is something happening? Without an accent, it's an enclitic. It means somehow, in any way, by any means. And then there are two-syllable interrogatives that have an enclitic indefinite version as well that we'll cover later. And the last group of enclitics are some common particles. Te is a conjunction. Ye adds force to what it follows, at least or even. And per also adds force to what it follows, meaning very much. That is an enclitic when it actually is connected to the end of a word. That completes our list of single-syllable enclitics, and now we're going to look at every possible way they can affect a preceding word. All right, let's take a look at words with their accent on the ultima. This can either be an acute or a circumflex. 
you might find it a little strange that I have a hare and tortoise here, but if you've seen my other videos, they will make sense. So these are oxytone or perispomenone words. A one-syllable enclitic will change nothing, since the acute or the circumflex can fall on this new virtual penult. Examples of these would be adofosmu and vusmu, my brother and my ox. Now let's take a look at paroxytone words, or words accented with an acute on their penult. A one-syllable enclitic will change nothing since this would make that penult the virtual antepenult, and an acute can fall on that syllable. An example would be a matter mu, my day. Looking at our example, some may object and say that our new ultima is a long syllable, and in that case, acute can only run to the penult. But this is where our analogy of saying that enclitics are additional syllables for words breaks down. The length of the enclitic doesn't matter. They are always counted as if they are short. So a matamu is fine and doesn't need any additional accenting. Finally, let's look at the pro words, the pro paroxytone and the pro perispomenone words, words that have their accents stretched to their furthest position. If we put an acute on the antepenult and then attach a one syllable enclitic to the end of the word, we have too many syllables for that acute. Our overall principle of not moving or changing an accent because of an enclitic, and our preference not to accent an enclitic, only leaves us with one remedy. We simply add a secondary accent to the ultima of the preceding word. In effect, we split the preceding word for accent purposes. And an example would be curiosmu. Notice that we don't change the acute on the ultima to a grav since the enclitic is considered part of the preceding word. The same thing happens with a circumflex at its furthest position. If we add an enclitic, there's too much, and so we have to add another accent, an acute on the ultima. An example would be thulosmu. All right, let's look at two-syllable enclitics now. Perhaps the most notable are present forms of the verbs to be and to say. These verbs are only enclitic in their present indicative forms. So here they are. Imi, I am, e, and in Koine, in Biblical Greek, it's a, esti, esmen, este, and ec. All of them are enclitic except the second person singular. The verb to say works the same way. Femi is enclitic, but face, you say, is not. Then we have feci, he says, famen, we say, fate, y'all say, fasi, they say. Those are all enclitic. You'll notice that when I am pronouncing them, though, I am accenting them on their final syllable, and that's what happens with two-syllable enclitics. When they must be accented, you will accent them on their final syllable. And that accent will be an acute, or if it's followed by another word, a grav. Now, there is an exception for the verb imi, which shouldn't be surprising. After uk, it won't be treated as an enclitic. It will have an accent on its ultima. So, I am not is ukimi. Uki, or uke in koine, isn't an enclitic to begin with, so there's no problem there. And the third person singular is very strange. It has an accent on its penult, ukesti. The remaining forms have the accent on the ultima, ukesmin, ukeste, and ukisi. Now we can finish off looking at the oblique and plural forms for the indefinite pronoun, someone or something. These are just third declension endings attached to the root ta, fi, yoda, nu. I have them listed nominative, accusative, genitive, dative. And then we just have two remaining indefinite adverbs. Pote, which means at some time or another, or at any time or ever. And pothen, again, you've probably seen that as an interrogative. Pothen with an acute on its penult, meaning from where or whence. But here as an enclitic, pothen would mean from somewhere, from some place or other. Very indefinite, not asking a question. He's from some place or other, not where is he from. All right, let's see how two-syllable enclitics affect our three types of words. First, we'll look at words accented on their ultima. This covers oxytone words, words with an acute on their ultima. And we can see that if we follow that acute with one or two syllables, we're fine. Acute can still run out three spaces. So there isn't a problem with oxytone words. But if we put a circumflex on the ultima, that's called a perispomenon word, one would think that the circumflex couldn't simply stand on the new ultima followed by two syllables without any assistance, because it would be standing on the virtual antepenult now. This is actually a tricky issue, and opinions on this issue have changed over time and can vary among editors. Goodwin, in point 160a, with the example sophontinus, 
and the majority of examples in classical literature don't have a problem with a two-syllable enclitic following the circumflex. This would be the other place where the analogy of an enclitic syllable simply attaching to the end of a word would break down. An example of this in the New Testament, Nassauland 27, 1 Corinthians 15.12, in Eumintinus. Notice we have an accent on the ultima, a circumflex, and it's followed by a two-syllable enclitic. Other examples of this solution can be found in Swetnam, his intro to the study of New Testament Greek. He cites Matthew 5.37, Mark 9.40, and Mark 14.4. So my general rule for dealing with enclitics, be they one syllable or two syllables, following a word that has an accent, no matter what accent, on the ultima, is to simply do nothing. Leave the enclitic unaccented. Now let's move on to words that have an acute on the penult. We call those paroxytone words. You will remember that when we had a word accented with an acute on the penult, we didn't have to do anything when it was followed by a one-syllable enclitic, since the acute would be on the virtual antepenult. But now, if we add another syllable to the enclitic, it would stretch the acute too far, leaving us three successive unaccented syllables. So something must be done. We can't accent the ultima of the preceding word with a secondary accent, since that would give us two successive acutes. Our only other option, then, is to accent the enclitic. And when we do this, we will always accent the last syllable of the enclitic. And our final logical possibility, where we have our accents stretched to their furthest positions, acute on the antepenult or circumflex on the penult, we face the same issue that we faced with a one-syllable enclitic where we had to add a secondary accent to the preceding word. We simply solve the problem with a two-syllable enclitic the same way. We could take curios as an example and follow it with esteen, he is the lord, and we'd end up with curiosestein. Or for example, with the circumflex, we could choose doulos, he is a servant, doulosestein. I know that you might be a little uncomfortable seeing two accents on the same word so close together, but they're different types, so it's okay. All right, let's review everything. For words accented on their ultima, be they acutes or circumflexes, an enclitic, no matter what kind, won't change anything. We just won't accent the enclitic at all. For words with an acute on their penult, we are fine with a one-syllable enclitic. We don't have to add any more accents, but a two-syllable enclitic will cause us to accent the enclitic. This is the only time so far that we will accent the enclitic. And then for words that have their accents stretched to their furthest position, anytime we follow them with any enclitic, we'll have to add a secondary accent, an acute on their ultima. Now that we've exhausted all possibilities for a normal word followed by an enclitic, let's take a look and see what happens when an enclitic follows a proclitic or another enclitic. The general rule is simply to accent the preceding proclitic or enclitic. There are two exceptions to this, and we've already seen the first. All forms of emi will normally be accented after uk, which is a proclitic. The other exception is that in classical Greek, it's common to accent the two-syllable forms of tis when they follow proclitics. In biblical Greek, we will follow the rule and accent the proclitic prior to any form of tis. Now, this general rule even applies to a series of enclitics. By leaning on the previous word for its accent, the enclitic will cause the previous one to be accented. Before I finish with a summary, I just want to go over all of the exceptions where we will accent the enclitic. I think these all will be fairly intuitive. We will have to accent an enclitic when it begins a sentence or clause because there's no word for it to lean on. We will end up accenting an enclitic when it's specifically emphasized. And we will accent an enclitic if the previous syllable that would normally have the accent is elided. Again, we don't have a syllable to accent. And the last one we've already mentioned a couple of times, we will accent me when it's preceded by uk. I'm going to finish with a review of all of the general principles for accenting enclitics. First, don't add or modify any accenting if the previous word is accented on its last syllable. Next, add an acute on the preceding word's ultima if the previous word's accent is stretched to its furthest position or the previous word is a proclitic or enclitic and then accent the enclitic if the enclitic is two syllables and the previous word is accented with an acute on its penult. If you found this video helpful, please consider writing a comment below or telling your friends about it on Facebook. You can also keep up to date with things I'm producing on facebook.com slash IBG page.